Kelly, and thank you for welcoming me as a visitor in these indigenous lands. It's a, a real pleasure. Um, Paul Kelly suffered from my inability to manage my uh, avalanche and torrent of emails, so despite her numerous requests, she never actually got a presentation title, so she kindly made one up for me, <laughs> which, is, which is an approximation of what I'm actually going to talk about today. I think we know each other well enough for her to have some estimation of what uh, topics I might want to talk about. So I want to talk to you really about a lot of the thinking I've been doing for the last year around person-centred care. I think the thing that we share in this room, probably all of us, is our desire for health systems and social care systems to be person-centred and centred around the individual. And I'd like to uh, share some of my reflections on that and to, which, to what extent it's possible and to sort of think about some of the challenges and potential ways forward to achieving that. But we can start with some good news. Michael Sidibe, the uh, executive director of UNAIDS, made this, uh, made this speech in 2017. He said, at the very beginning, it was a few gay men who said no to indifference, to silence and to inaction. Not only did they say this, they also created, championed and led a transformative movement, bringing a people-centered approach to the global health paradigm. So, Clearly, it's all been achieved. We have person-centred care and we can all go home, which is great news. <laughs> but of course, I would challenge that and I would like to share some data and some reflections today on the extent to which we are achieving person-centred care. Because it's uh, terminology that we're hearing increasingly. You, you can hardly read a paper or go to a presentation without people using the word person-centredness. And I think we're not stopping enough to think about what that really what might mean rather than making it a throwaway phrase. I'm sure many of you know this WHO document on HIV and disability, which is a really important document in, uh, in the number of outputs that we get from WHO. I think this is quite an important one because it aims to integrate rehabilitation within the HIV care continuum, which I'm sure, again, all of us would share in this room as an important goal. Because what they want us to achieve is clinicians and healthcare workers managing the increased complexity of HIV. And I think that's another kind of common theme of the day is the increasing complexity that people face when they're living with HIV and trying to manage some of the sequelae of HIV. This HIV and disability document makes a number of recommendations, again, which you might be able to predict. It's the sort of thing we write at the end of reports. We need better policy, we need better inclusion, and we need accessible environments. I'm sure there's no surprise there. What they do say this document is, is, an exam is, a, is a compendium of examples of practice. They've looked around the world to see where there are good examples of integration of disability and HIV. They do include great examples of innovation, but what I would say is stark, starkly noticeable in this report is its innovation without evidence. And of course, I'm sure we would share a concern with that. Innovation is important, but we need to be able to capture it, evaluate it, disseminate it, replicate it. So I think we are working in a field with an inadequate evidence base. There are a number of systematic reviews out there which are pointing to evidence of effectiveness. And of course, I would note Kelly's uh, systematic reviews from last year on aerobic exercise and resistive exercise for people living with HIV, but we still don't have enough evidence. So here's the WHO model for person-centered care. The person is at the center of the healthcare system and how it operates. So around the person, really importantly, we have the family as well. Around that, we have the community. And then we have this goal of universal, equitable, people-centered, and integrated health services. Now, this is a really, really important goal. If we're going to achieve this, we need our service delivery networks, practitioners working around the individual as the center of the system. We need the health sector to underpin that. And then, of course, we need all of the other sectors which make a difference to people, like education, social assistance, labor, housing, to be engaged in this endeavor of person-centeredness. And it needs to be a country priority. So, of course, it's not something we can just achieve at the one-to-one -one, um, level when a clinician is with an individual living with a condition. We need a whole health systems approach to really make sure that the individual is at the center of the health system. So I've been looking a lot in the last year at definitions of person-centered care and what it means because, of course, we, we do believe that disease prevention and management of disease are absolutely essential. Nobody is saying we, we shouldn't do that. Absolutely core activities. 
But prevention and management alone are inefficient to just or insufficient for us to meet all the person level needs of the individual, of the family and to the community. It's not just about the disease, we need to think, be thinking about the individual. And why might personal centeredness matter to us, particularly in the context of HIV? Well, particularly in the, in the world of 90 by 90 by 90, as I'm sure you know, the WHO believes that we can eliminate new infections if we get 90% of people tested, 90% of those on treatment, and 90% of those with undetectable viral load. But that requires us to health, have health services and health systems in which people can engage and be retained. So we need person-centred care, I would argue, for us to optimise patient engagement and retention in care services. We get better community ownership of services if they're person-centred, and they are, of course, more sustainable if the community owns and, and buys into a health service. But those health systems must reflect what matters to the patient and their families. That's absolutely key. And there's a nice definition here from the Institute of Medicine that defines high-quality care as care that is safe, effective, patient-centred, efficient, timely and equitable. So I'm really happy to see that patient-centredness is part of this definition of high quality. And the International Alliance of Patients Organisations says that patient-centredness is care that's focused and organised around people rather than disease. It's organised around health needs and expectations. And of course, that's what we do in HIV rehabilitation and palliative care, is think about the individual and their needs and not necessarily about the disease. So we see individuals, families and communities as participants in their health care, not just beneficiaries. And it must be responsive to their needs. It's a real needs-based approach rather than a disease-based approach. So it needs to be holistic if we're going to be person-centred, so thinking beyond a very basic medical model. And if we measure this and we can get a sense of the person-centeredness of a health system and how effective we are in achieving that, we can really inform policy practice and drive up quality at the health system's level. And that's much of the thinking that I've been doing for the last year is how can we drive health systems to be better quality through being person-centered. We believe also that being more person-centered can reduce the inequalities that we see in healthcare provision if we're able to take that needs-based approach rather than an approach which is based in diagnosis and or prognosis. So let's think about person-centeredness and the global policy context. Well, the WHO published quite a nice uh, strategy in 2015 on person-centered care, which is very much about considering local context and drawing on local evidence, and I think that draws us back in rehabilitation, particularly to be focusing on generating a larger evidence base. And there's a vision within the person-centred care strategy that all people have access to health services that are provided in a way that responds to their preferences, are coordinated around their needs, and are safe, effective, timely, efficient, and of an acceptable quality. And that timely issue, I think, is very, very interesting for our topic that we're talking about today, particularly when you look at Kelly's model of episodic disability in HIV. How are we going to get health systems to be responsive enough to the phenomenon of episodic disability. And I think, I think that's one of the major challenges that we face. And of course, the other major policy uh, win that we have from lots of lobbying is the new WHO's universal health coverage goals, which all governments are fighting for, that people receive a continuum of health promotion, disease prevention, diagnosis, treatment, management, rehabilitation and palliative care. So to be in the UHC, I think, is really important. This is a position we must now monopolise and build on. Values-based healthcare. This is something I've been reading about and thinking a lot about for the last year. I have to say, this was my read for, for 2017, 2018. This is the book that's influenced my thinking most. A colleague of mine, Sridhar Venkatapuram, who has an interesting background. He was trained in public health and also in philosophy and is now seconded to the WHO working in human rights. And I really recommend you read this book, Debates in Values-Based Healthcare, because I think it's got something really, really important to tell us. The idea of having values-based healthcare is a mechanism whereby we can produce better outcomes through better governance of the patient health care provider engagement that integrates science and values, because we've got to have the right values about the individual that we seek to serve if we're going to have quality person-centred care. 
And Srida also comments in this book that psychosocial aspects of well-being and need, i.e. the aspects of person-centred care, can have direct bearing on the health of a patient, but clinicians hardly engage with these domains. And this is really the problem with the medical model that we've inherited. But there are some examples of changing practice, and I was kind of look at the work that Darren's achieved at the Chelsea and Westminster. I'm always quite impressed what I notice quite... Uh, how many clinicians are referring to his rehab service, that's changing values-based practice. Clinicians, nurses and doctors are recognising rehabilitation needs, assessing them and then referring them. And I think that's a nice example of actually changing practice. And I think we should uh, acknowledge that. So what are some of the implications of this uh, values-based healthcare that we're talking about? Well, here's some data that we published early this year from Zimbabwe that values-based healthcare for people living with HIV really means exclusion from care. So clinicians thinking that the, the populations we were working with, so key populations, so that's LGBT people and sex workers, are actually guilty of bad behaviour and deserve what they get. So here's a nurse who says, there's a prostitute who lives down the road there, now is having HIV and AIDS. She used to take other people's husbands. Most people would say, let her suffer. It's her time now. She used to make others suffer, so it's her time. So their values very much dictate the access that this woman is going to get for her HIV treatment and care. This sex worker said, they say we're doing something illegal, which is prostitution, so you won't get the medication, so they won't give you the medication when they have it. So this is an app based on the values of the healthcare professional. It's an utter refusal of treatment. So based on the, this work that we do, we've done in Zimbabwe, we're now trying to develop this more to, to find interventions which take a values-based healthcare approach. I have a rather brilliant nurse working with me at the moment from Ghana, and here's some data she's just collected from people living with HIV in Ghana. And this woman, with 38-year-old woman living with HIV, said, staff don't really ask me about what matters to me because their questions are always about my medication. So I think, I mean, there's a, there's a difficulty, of course, in low- and middle-income countries, you have high patient loads and low resources, but it really is driven by a medical model. And this 35-year-old man said, I'm not involved in my care, and staff don't ask me my opinion about my care, and I don't know if I have a role to play in my care, and staff don't ask what matters to me. I would like to say I'm going to give you some more data from the UK later, which also echoes this, because what's really important to say is this is not about low- and middle-income countries. This is a global phenomenon. So this is certainly not finger-pointing because the stuff we see in the UK is the same. So we have a global mission to make things more person-centred. Well, I'll show you some data from... We've just finished a, a project called uh, Positive Outcomes in the UK in Dublin with Colm's team and in Brighton in London. And this person living with HIV said to us, I think in general terms, I would like to hear them say, how is your physical health? How is your weight? How is your mobility? Is there anything going on there? So there's a real responsibility on clinicians to change the way they conduct assessment, not just feeding back CD4s and viral loads twice a year. A commissioner, so to translate that, commissioners in the UK are part of our bizarre NHS uh, configuration, and these are people that essentially purchase care services. So they decide what healthcare needs to be de delivered for the population, and they pay for it to be delivered. So this commissioner has, has asked, what matters in terms of patient-centred outcomes to you? What are you looking to see in terms of healthcare that you purchase that's going to make a difference? And this commissioner said, I expect adherence to be discussed in their clinic appointment. I expect them to be updated on their latest blood results. I'd expect partner notification. So we can really see that healthcare services are being purchased and delivered as real test and treat interventions rather than person-centred care interventions. And here's some data we published last year from people with advanced illness. Here's a, a white British gay man in his 50s living with HIV and COPD. It's hard work going through 20, 30 odd years of history and you can't get your breath and you're trying to explain and try and talk at the same time, which makes it worse. So every time this poor guy has an exacerbation, he goes back into the ambulance service, he goes back into an acute admission and he has to explain his problems each time. This is not a person-centred way of delivering care. If this guy's trying in a, an exacerbation of breathlessness to explain his problems in his medical history. This gay man, 64, living with HIV and prostate cancer, told us 
but not knowing what's out there or what's going on out there, I find it difficult asking the right questions and I finish up spending an hour of somebody's time just trying to work out what's good for me. So the problem here is the responsibility is very much on the individual to know what questions to ask and who to ask rather than the, the information being centred around him. And we really need to think more carefully about how we deliver information services. And back to the guy with HIV and COPD. I invariably go into A&E, accident and emergency, in Hospital X. We're on first name terms. They clerk me in easily. I've had excellent care. But if I go to Hospital Y, because you can't always choose, the ambulance takes you to the nearest hospital. If I go to Hospital Y, it's not a nice place to end up. They don't have a backstory there. It's hard to go through 20 or 30 years of history when you're breathless. Before, they were happy to drive me to Hospital X 45 minutes ago, but now they think I won't make it, so they take me 15 minutes away to Hospital Y. But I have to say there's a really nice initiative in London, across all London boroughs now, that the ambulance service for people with advanced disease can immediately pull up a file on anybody, which can stop them being admitted, can see their care planning if they've been asked for not to have an admission, and they can prevent this happening. So there is an initiative now in London for the ambulance service to be able to link to all patients' records and to see this person is not for an admission or they have a care plan to avoid admissions. And here this guy's putting his, his issues into a broader context. The other main symptom I've had is falls. I have Cushing syndrome from the steroids and terrible pain and leg weakness. I get stuck in the bath. And I think that's what put me at the suicide risk in the first place, severe worrying. So this guy's problems are beyond his disease. He has many, many psychosocial concerns. So what are some of the challenges to quality of care for people living with HIV? Well, when we think about multimorbidity in HIV, there's a great concern about how we get best communication and assessment when we're crossing specialty areas, because people living with HIV are now seeing cardiologists, they're seeing care of the elderly, they're seeing neurologists. How's that seeing oncologists? How's that going to work? And there was a study uh, published in the UK last year saying that actually people living with HIV who are developing these serious comorbidities do need additional to support to be able to manage this transition across specialties. And they're also reporting some additional stress about thinking of the stigma of that, having to go and see a cardiologist who's never actually managed HIV or an oncologist and thinking about some of the potential stigma they might face. This data I thought was very interesting from Ontario that I found. Um, a retrospective study of deaths in Ontario. It was published last year, 2017. So compared, looked at all deaths and compared HIV deaths compared to all other deaths. People with HIV were dying younger, 56 versus 76. In the last 90 days, they spent more time in hospital, so they spent 20 out of the last 90 days in hospital versus 12 days out of 90 for people who died without HIV as the un underlying contributing factor, and their costs were much higher. Now, this study we ran a couple of years ago, PRISMA, across seven European countries and Africa, showed that actually the general public, two-thirds, want to die at home. People don't want to die in hospital. Yet you can see that people with HIV at the end of life are spending a significant amount of time in hospital. That is not person-centred. And also this uh, data we've just published this year was an analysis of death certification in 12 countries around the world. And uh, I led the analysis on HIV and we could see that HIV patients compared to cancer patients are much more likely to die in hospital. And there may be some clinical reasons around uncertainty, etc. But actually dying in hospital is not person-centred care and it's not where people want to die. I'd like to talk a little bit about pain. I'm sure many of you know that pain is one of my big interests in HIV. We know that it's highly prevalent. We know it's associated with things like poorer quality of life, viral rebound, risk taking, poor adherence, treatment switching, and suicidal ideation. We've shown all that in a number of cross-sectional studies. Pain really matters from a clinical and public health perspective. But we've showed um, with some data led by Jesse Merlin that we've just had accepted this year in JA. Jesse Merlin, some of you may know, is an HIV physician in the US with a particular interest in pain. She looked at over 2,000 people living with HIV. 25% of those had chronic pain. A quarter of those were having problems with no show and had missed at least one primary care visit. And chronic pain in these people living with HIV in the US, I think it was in the southwest of the US, was associated with no-shows, but also associated with virologic failure. So pain really is important, and that data should be available soon. 
Another study that we've just completed and is a uh, review at the moment is the Poppy cohort. So it's a large cohort study led by Carolyn Sabin and Alan Winston. Alan Winston, you might recognise, was here last year or the year before talking on neurocognitive deficit. We've just submitted this cohort study for publication. Three cohorts were recruited in the UK. Older people living with HIV, so age 50 and above, that's 700 people. Uh, people aged below 50 living with HIV who were demographically and lifestyle matched, that was 374. And an older demographically lifestyle matched who were uh, HIV negative, age 50 and above, and that was 300. And we've just been analysing the pain data on that. And we can see that 70% of the older people living with HIV had pain in the last month compared to 63% of younger people living with HIV. But what the interesting thing is here, we can see that the pain prevalence for younger people living with HIV is similar to older HIV negative people. So clearly pain is a big issue for younger people living with HIV. And the same story for current pain, you can see in the middle column, younger people living with HIV had a similar prevalence of current pain to older HIV negative people. So pain is a real issue. And of those with pain in the last month, 14% had missed days of work or study due to pain. So there's a clearly a rehab issue here. And 60% had seen their doctor about their pain. So that's interesting. So two things I'd think there. That means 41% of people haven't reported their pain. And we've seen this in previous studies that uh, patients don't think that their clinician's interested in their pain, so they don't bother mentioning it. But also, They've seen a doctor about pain, yet they've still got pain. So we've got real questions here about the efficacy of pain management. And people living with HIV with current pain had more depressive symptoms, poorer quality of life, and greater functional impairment regardless of their age group. I'm a great believer in the potential for South and North learning, so I'm delighted to say I've got a fantastic uh, palliative care academic nurse from Malawi with me on a postdoc, Kennedy and Comma. He uh, did an RCT of a brief pain educational intervention for people living with HIV in Malawi. Very simple, 30-minute educational intervention about pain and its management, a leaflet about pain, and a two-week follow-up call. Um, and he followed up patients and carers, and he showed that the, uh, patient, the primary outcome, which was mean pain intensity, at uh, eight weeks showed a difference from this really, really simple intervention. You just give people 30 minutes, a leaflet, and talk to them about pain, and you can actually reduce their pain intensity at eight weeks. So a really, really simple intervention, and we need to be thinking more about that, how we can translate South learning back to Northern contexts. So Kennedy's just done a systematic review with Jesse Merlin and us on um, pain self-management. So looking at pain and symptom self-management in people with HIV. And that's just been accepted last week in J-AIDS. And he uh, did a quality assessment of the evidence for self-management. I don't know about you guys, but in the UK, self-management is very uh, hot topic at the moment. The government and the NHS think it's the way to go. I'm concerned it's probably because they think it's cheap. But, um, <laughs> but it's the big thing. To, if you bid for self-management at the moment, you've got a good chance of getting your grant funded. So um, we found 22 original papers reporting 19 studies on pain and symptom self-management in HIV, 17 used RCT designs, one in three reported pain outcomes, and six in 13 reported uh, positive data for physical symptoms. There is a little body of evidence suggesting that you can self-manage pain, self pain and symptoms in HIV. And in terms of the interventions that were supported, the ways of delivering, a nice, uh, diverse, heterogeneous ways of delivering self-management, might be online, it might be face-to-face, -face, or it could be group-based. And the, the context of the, uh, the intervention that are being delivered were booklets, leaflets, and manuals. The problem is, most of the evidence in HIV uh, pain and symptom self-management is from the US, a bit of Europe, but it's largely white gay men. So we need to really think a little bit broad, more broadly about that. And we have a grant currently to do that, particularly working with um, African communities in the UK. I think it's really important that we think about um, the cultural dimensions of pain. Cult pain is culturally experienced and expressed. We did some work a while ago, we've done some work in sub-Saharan Africa on people living with severe pain, and we got funding to bring that back to African communities in the UK to generate some recommendations for particularly around spiritual care of people living with HIV and cancer. 
We know from the literature that people of African and Caribbean origin have under-treatment of pain. Most of that work has come from the US, showing that African Americans have much more poorly treated pain than Caucasians. A uh, colleague of mine, Jonathan Kaufman, has done some work on pain in advanced cancer in the UK and found, found that African Caribbeans living in the UK saw their pain as a punishment and a test of faith that doesn't need analgesia. So there may be some cultural dimensions that prevent people getting uh, appropriate and effective analgesia. I think also, as I'm talking a lot about person-centeredness, a lot of the stuff I'm thinking about at the moment is the fact that actually this concept of person-centeredness is a pretty Western phenomenon. There's a really nice paper from some, from some African theorist, Seth Lari et al., that talked about actually the fact that this concept of person-centeredness really lacks a theoretical underpinning in the African context. And I'm sure you could uh, put Asia or anything you liked in the word of Africa because it's a fairly Western notion. And we also know that individual decisions can be regulated by culture. So this is some data I published a few years ago with colleagues in South Africa where we found that actually, yes, people like the idea of things like advanced care panic, planning and self-empowerment and making decisions, but in that context, in that causal culture in South Africa, if you're a female, you have less power to make decisions. The community makes decisions and not you. And also, actually, in the context of low resources, it's nice to be able to make a choice, but if nobody can afford to pay for that choice, then the choice is a moot point. And here's a nice, I don't, I don't think this has come out very well, from the Seth Lare paper, they've looked at this concept, this is the model they drew to look at this concept of... Um, person-centeredness in the African culture and it's saying actually it comes down to whether you see yourself as independent or interdependent with your community so if you see yourself as intrinsically linked with your family and your community members then they are part of your decision making and part of your community that would help decide on how your care is decided and delivered but actually in western notions where we see ourselves as more independent this idea of person-centeredness will play out very differently and it'd be really interesting for you guys to be thinking about what that might mean in the Canadian context. So lastly I'd like to just move on to positive outcomes which is a study we've just completed it was just presented at the last uh, British HIV Association conference, so Brighton and Sussex Hospital, King's College London, St James in Dublin, UK CAB, which is our community group of people looking at HIV, the National HIV Nurses Association, the British HIV Association, funded by Mac AIDS Fund and the St Stephen's AIDS uh, Trust. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is uh, develop a novel patient reported outcome measure for people living with HIV. Really important that I recognise my brilliant colleague Catherine Bristow has been doing most of this work to develop face and content validity and also think about stakeholder views for implementation because of course there's no point trying to deliver a tool if people living with HIV and their care teams don't see it as beneficial. So we know now that HIV is what we call a chronic condition with potentially near normal life expectancy. However, let's make that life worth living, I always say. If you're going to have a life expectancy that's normal, let's say make it something you really want to have. The problem is health-related quality of life for people on treatment is poorer than the UK general population. We know, you know, I don't do these studies anymore because I think I started boring people, but I have a particular interest in pain and symptoms, really high burden of symptoms, which are physical, psychological, social and spiritual. We've got emerging physical complications, things like bone density, which we heard yesterday, cardiovascular problems, renal, liver, malignancies. We're seeing all these problems emerging. There was a nice paper a couple of years ago that called the contribution of physical and mental health to health-related quality of life as the current critical challenge in HIV medicine. So this is a paper I cite widely. I think this person is absolutely right. We know also some previous work I've done that UK outpatient attendees with HIV think care doesn't address those issues that matter to them, their physical, mental and social well-being. And we know that these outcomes really, really matter clinically as well. So we know that person-centred care is what we need for people living with HIV. Amy Justice in the US has done some great studies showing that in the average HIV clinical encounter, the uh, HIV clinician detects one-third of the patient's problems. So all of this stuff is going undetected. We know also that from a couple of systematic reviews that the routine use of patient-reported outcome measures can help us identify problems and concerns and can also improve outcomes for patients. The evidence base isn't as good as it should be, but there's some evidence of potential effectiveness. 
In the, in the UK, the NHS has had a policy drive for us to use patient reported outcome measures and a lot of community work was done at the beginning of my project by UK CAB with community groups around the UK who said, yes, we really want this measure and this is how it should be. We know that patient reported outcome measures are being used increasingly by drug companies, but they're not being used in routine <laughs> HIV care. We, there are a number of measures out there, which is great. I'm certainly not going to suggest that I've designed the first uh, patient reported outcome measure for people with HIV, but they tend to be single dimension. Is it depression? Is it stigma? Is it adherence? We need something that's multidimensional. So there was no brief person-centered outcome measure that reflects the range of outcomes which are relevant for people living with HIV that's going to drive and evaluate routine care. So what we aim to do was determine the priorities of adults living with HIV in terms of what outcomes we should measure from their NHS care, develop a patient reported outcome measure, and also to think really importantly about how that should be implemented. And one of my colleagues, Barbara and Tunis, did a systematic review of PROMS a couple of years ago in terms of their implementation, and it was really clear, if they're going to work, get your stakeholders on board from the outset. So that's what we tried to do. So it's an observational qualitative study. We use the COSMIN guidance, which any of you working in healthcare measurement scales will know their tox taxonomy and guidance, and the Rothrock guidance on the development of items for, for a valid PROM. So we talked to 28 people living with HIV, 21 multi-professionals and eight commissioners. You can see the Rothrock model of how we went through the evidence and the development of the items, which was working through the literature, the data, and then we had an item generation meeting of four people living with HIV, four health researchers and five HIV professionals. We spent an afternoon arguing about what should be in and what should be out but uh, we did reach consensus, which is great, and then we had a second round of revisions to refine those items. Then we did si uh, six cognitive interviews with a maximum variation sample of people living with HIV to understand does this make sense and what's missing, and then we did some further rounds of cognitive interviews on our, um, on our refinements. So here's our sample of people living with HIV and the professionals and the commissioners. People talked about diverse but interrelated problems, and under the six domains they talked about physical problems, cognitive problems, psychological problems, welfare problems, social problems, and information needs. They also said they wanted an item which is a global assessment of well-being and some free text opportunities. And free text is something we use in one of our other outcome measures, the POS, which we're now using in 140 countries around the world. And that idea of a free text identification of the problem at the end is really, really important. So what might the benefits be of a PROM? For people living with HIV, they said it's going to make our care more person-centered and it's going to empower us. It's going to help people living with HIV to raise their concerns, to feel heard and valued, and to share sensitive information. It's going to help build resilience and self-confidence. It's going to encourage better referrals for additional support. I don't know about you, but our NHS is shrinking, so all the additional services within HIV care are being stripped out, so you really have to be referred out now for things like psychological care. It's going to reduce the assumptions about what matters to you, because I'm actually going to ask you what matters to you. It's going to get an individual baseline and help you to monitor changes over time. It's help us get to know new patients. And really importantly, it's going to go beyond adherence and viral load. For services, it's going to enable us to tailor to specific needs, understand the changing picture, get more efficient, build confidence in clinicians. Because what we've found in previous research that we've published is actually if you've got a sound, well-structured PROM, it helps clinicians feel confident to ask the things that matter and also help us to justify current spending. Some of the challenges are going to be the heterogeneity of people living with HIV because, of course, we are looking at a diverse uh, population. Issues around literacy because we still face that challenge, and I know that's something in Dublin as well. Um, there's um, a little bit of a concern amongst clinicians about opening up a can of worms and asking about things they don't feel capable to manage. So, of course, people need to feel well supported. And the most important thing is data must be used. Proms should not be a tick box exercise. Uh, in my building in the afternoon, the clinicians always have a, an MDT in the afternoon. They have the outcome measures up on the screen. Each patient they review, they see the outcome measures over time, they discuss their outcome measure response and how they're going to clinically respond to that. And that's how PROM data should be used. It should be driving patient care. 
So we've got 23 items, and this may reduce yet to physical, cognitive, psychological, welfare, social and information. And that includes the single item for global assessment and the free text option. And everything is scored on a Likert scale. So on summary of our prom, we know that people living with HIV and their care teams want an HIV-specific prom that reflects the range of outcomes of people living with HIV. People want it to drive, evaluate and improve care. And we know from our study now that we have face and content validity and we've used the best available methods that we, we can in terms of health scale development. And some of you may have heard of the Emerge project, which I'm part of, so in five European countries now. Uh, we've got the PROM going onto an app and we've got three and a half thousand people living with HIV across Europe who are going to be using this PROM on their phone. In fact, I'm going from here to Barcelona for that meeting to see how that's going. So very excitingly, we're looking at stable patients using this PROM for their care management. Last couple of things I want to share with you is the Beaver standards. So this is a seven year cycle. Every seven years, people living with HIV, Esther's part of that team, people living with HIV, clinicians, nurses, doctors, social workers, allied health professionals, come together and write a really, this is free online, a really detailed set of standards of care for people living with HIV. Free, freely available. The idea is somebody living with HIV can pick up these standards, go and see any clinician, social care agency and say, this is what I should expect. I should expect you to meet all of these standards in my care and I demand it. So it's quite a long, long process to develop these standards of care, but these have just been launched at the last Beaver conference. And I did some work on that this year. So within the standard that we've developed this year, it's about communication being shared at a manner and pace in line with patient preference, being an ongoing process for should preferences and priorities change, making sure that we understand what information has been shared and understanding patient insight with their disease, making sure that we recognise clinical uncertainty, particularly for those people where prognosis or recovery might be complex or unpredictable, Palliative rehabilitation is now in the Beaver Standards of Care, which I'm absolutely delighted about, and I'm sure Darren is too. And um, the, the Beaver Standards are, are a model which I would recommend that you guys have a look at, because I have to say, I think it's something that as a community we're, we're quite proud of. So I've been given my five-minute warning, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm on my 30-second warning, so... <laughs> Uh, on my final slide now. So Kelly looked into her crystal ball and, and well predicted that I would look at future and where we're going. So, so what ongoing research is in the pipeline that we hope we'll be able to talk about in the next few years? So I'm glad to say we've just, just heard from NIH. We've got a study in India looking at HIV and cancer and some of the stigma around that. So that's going to be really interesting on how we make oncology services more person-centred. We've got a big programme of work now looking at the theoretical underpinnings and practice of person-centred across conditions across Asia, um, the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, which is going to be very exciting. With Emerge and also a new programme called Integrate, funded by the EU and a WHO programme that I'm leading, we're looking at apps and mHealth and using PROMs for better care for people living with HIV and cancer. We've got Darren's systematic review, which we're looking forward to, looking at the uh, systematic review of global disability, uh, the prevalence of that. Uh, really delighted that we've got a British Council Fellowship for Kelly, who's coming this year, is going to be looking more at the HIV disability measure. So we're going to have some great data coming out of that. Um, through the Global Challenges Research Fund, we're looking at person-centeredness and health system strengthening, which is really important in Africa, and also looking at conflict and health in the Middle East, so looking at the idea of person-centeredness in conflict. So I'm working in Jordan with Syrians and Palestinians, trying to understand the nature of having been through the trauma of uh, being a refugee and displaced and what that might mean for social connectedness and reoccurrence of trauma. Access Care C has just launched, so we're looking at better communication across the health system for people in terms of sexuality. We've got the pain self-management grant, so we're developing a uh, pain self-management intervention translating from Africa to the UK. And then Simon's here. Where's Simon? And there's Simon. So with the Mild May, uh, they've been collecting. We've got a, a collaboration across the UK called UK Rock, all specialist rehabilitation inpatient units upload outcome and cost data. We've just uh, published some data 
showing, it's really great data you can show within specialist rehab according to patient complexity, what's the cost per admission, what are the outcomes you achieve for that, but also how many weeks of specialist rehabilitation do you need to recoup that cost? So we've published it for all specialist rehab in the UK. We've just done an MS analysis, and Simon's now going to be uploading the data for HIV, so we're going to be able to show, if you refer to his specialist HIV rehab centre, what's the complexity of the patient, what outcomes do you achieve, and how many weeks of his service do you have to buy to recoup that investment? I'm really, really excited about that, because that's the kind of evidence I think we need for people to be investing in these services. So that's a quick uh, forward scale to the future. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we have uh, a few minutes for questions, please, and uh, uh, there's a lot there, so there must be some questions, some initial questions. Some of, uh, of you can ask questions after. Anybody has? Yes, please. Hello. Hi, Julian Flutes from Montreal. Thank you very much for that excellent talk. Patient-centered care bumps up against the, emer the increasing literature which says the old-style medical care, which is we don't need to see you, we need to see your viral load, we'll text you your result once a year, thank you very much. Yeah. That is the reality. There is literature, it, the medical literature, which says once a year is all we need to see your viral load. How do we, uh, how, do, how do we reconcile these two very divergent yeah. Um, forces? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that, that's the golden question, isn't it? So my view is that the evidence can show us that, yes, you're absolutely right. You can have a reduced medical model of HIV management, which is a yearly CD4 viral load. The argument is, if you don't take a person-centred approach, and you don't understand people's context, you don't understand their uh, psychological, their uh, um, social concerns and problems, they're actually going to end up having problems with adherence, having problems with uh, maintaining in care. So my argument, I, I remember sitting in, in Washington pulling my hair out when they were doing the next five-year planning for the PEPFAR, um, 45 billion investment, they asked me along very nice, but that's all they wanted to do is what you're saying. And I was saying to them, the problem with that, if you have a really reduced medical model, which is test and treat, and have a, a minimal level of follow-up, what's going to happen? You're going to leave people with lots of unassessed and unmanaged social and psychological concern, which is going to lead to adherence, which is going to lead to this medical model not being as effective as you think it is. So we need to constantly be showing evidence that if you ignore those other aspects of patient identity and need, everything is so interrelated and interconnected, if you ignore it, you ignore it at your peril, and there is going to be sequelae in terms of your medical management of these patients. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Fanta, and you said, like, to you guys do the research in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa and bring it to UK. Um, as you research here, we understand that the type of HIV is different from Africa and UK or Canada or states. So how that research will be reflective to people in UK, or I want to know also if you do research in UK population and bring it back to Africa, how the correlation between the two uh, different population being different continent and different type of uh, virus and different, different type of gene also, because we are different. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So I guess most of my research has been in sub-Saharan Africa for the past 15 years. And some examples of the transfer, so I developed outcome measures in Africa which are now actually part of um, standards of care for many NGOs within sub-Saharan Africa saying we have to use this measure 
to show it's a quality service. And what we developed with colleagues in Africa was some aspects of inclusion of spiritual well-being. This is an example. Spiritual well-being as part of your clinical assessment. Because we showed in some quality of life studies that actually quality of life was the strongest, um, spirituality was the strongest predictor of quality of life for people living with HIV and cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. We developed a single item to include in a multidimensional tool in sub-Saharan Africa. It went really well. It's been... Um, been used and now when they were updating outcome measurement in the UK I offered this what was really interesting is that patients and clinicians saw this item and said this is really helpful this is what we should be using there's a strong patient voice and now so the item that we've developed in Africa is now part of the UK government's standard set of outcome tools in the UK a simple measurement of spiritual well-being so you can actually translate things and the idea of pain self-management in, in sub-Saharan Africa it's worked really well with Kennedy's work, but of course 50% of people living or being diagnosed with HIV in the UK are people from sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a huge African community of people living with HIV in the UK. So what I've uh, asked to do in this grant is we want to do some cultural adaptation of the pain self-management intervention. So what I'm not doing is a single intervention. We're doing adaptation of it. So men who have sex with men and people from sub-Saharan Africa, people li uh, living with HIV in the UK, may have a differentiation of that intervention. But the idea is that it has the core value of self-management. Thank you. I'm sorry we need to take a little break, yeah, but please hunt this man down <laughs> and ask him as many questions because he's got a lot of good wisdom and information for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're gonna